Okay, so as you explained, I'm going to be talking about software supply chain security, or as I like to call it, getting hacked because of other people's software. Um, yeah, this is my obligatory XKCD for the talk. Um, any software you build, uh, you know, effectively sits on top of dozens, if not hundreds, of other projects. Whether it's whether this represents like a, a container or an infrastructure project or whatever, you're always building on top of other other stuff. Whether it's um, projects, binaries, and this stuff can, you know, come from Microsoft or it can come from Apache or it could be some like random person in Nebraska's project. Um, but all of this is sort of risk in a way. Okay, we have to trust all of this. And that's essentially what supply chain security is. Um, and we've recently been seeing like a, a lot of growth in supply chain attacks. Uh, I think this statistic um, was largely caused by typo squatting attacks. So you've probably seen like things like NPM. Um, you'll see like NPM repositories that are typos of a famous NPM repository. So it might be something like React with the E and the A transposed or something. And if you're a developer, you accidentally typo the name, you get a library that seems to work, and you might not even notice, but there may be malicious code in there, which might do something you don't like now or possibly later in the future. Now, typo squatting is a fairly sort of simple attack. Um, at the other end of the scale, we have things like the solar winds attack. Uh, I don't know if anybody read Wired recently, but they had a really good article um, just a few days ago on the solar winds attack that tried to recreate the timeline uh, and went through it all in a, as much detail as anybody has so far. Um, but yeah, this is a really sophisticated attack. The attackers actually targeted the build servers of solar winds. So solar winds themselves ended up building releases uh, with this malicious code injected into them unwittingly. Um, so the big problem here was, if you were a user of the SolarWinds software, uh, even if you checked the signature in the software, it was correct. If you went to the server and downloaded a new version, you still got the hacked version, because they were. It was basically being distributed as legal software, but the attacks had still managed to put this uh, malicious code inside. But the attackers weren't really interested in SolarWinds. SolarWinds was just the, the way to get into the other targets, which notably was people like the US government, including the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, the Treasury Department, um, also Intel, Cisco, Palo Alto Networks, uh, Microsoft and Mandiant. Mandiant's quite an interesting one. I think they were one of the first people to, to get to the bottom of what was going on. Um, but they were hacked themselves, and they were a security company. Uh, and kind of one of the points here is that these people sort of know what they're doing or should know what they're doing. They certainly invest a lot of resources into security and have uh, various measures to try and detect stuff like this. Uh, and they still fail. Um, now, I can't really tell you how to prevent an attack as sophisticated as SolarWinds. Um, you'd probably be thinking about things like network security. I think that actually the main discovery and how they got to the bottom of what was going on was eventually somebody noticed uh, a network request to an unexpected domain. Um, but, um, and this is the main takeaway from this talk, by the way, uh, I can give you some advice on sort of simple, low-hanging fruit that you can do to improve your sort of supply chain security and make sure the images that you're building are secure. Um, the main things I'm going to talk about, uh, verifying third-party artifacts, uh, which we sometimes call provenance, uh, signing your own images, and I'll talk about SigStore, uh, and give you a demo of using SigSor to do this. Um, reducing your software dependencies. So the less software you run in production, the lower your sort of attack surface. Um, and hopefully, the uh, less chance of, a, of being hacked and so on. Um, I think this keeps software up to date. I mean, this seems obvious and simple, but this really is the one that gets people, I think. So a lot of people get hacked because they're running like a Mongo server that's two years out of date, and they've just forgotten about it. Um, yeah, so keeping stuff up to date really does help. Uh, and there are techniques, I'm not going to go into them 
too much in this talk, but it's some of you might have heard of like Build Horizon. So I Google this, they have an idea of Build Horizon. Uh, and if you're running like a, a container in production, um, after a week or whatever, it has to be rebuilt and redeployed. So it's got like the, the newest version of code and dependencies and so on. And remember, just because you might not have, you know, the, the service itself might not have changed, but the underlying libraries or other things in the image may need to be updated. Um, yeah, use a security scanner. So I suspect that there's, do people here use security scanners like Sneak, Trivi, Gripe? Yeah, a few of you. I expect most of you have probably played with them at least. Um, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Um, all these things are relatively simple or simplish. Um, you can certainly go and have a, a play with them, um, put some of them in place, and uh, you know, start looking at processes to improve them like next week if you wanted. Um, going further, these are sort of more in-depth projects that would take you longer. Um, reproducible builds. So that's the idea. If I build a binary, or in our case, a container image, excuse me, and I do the same build again like a week later, if I give it the same inputs, I should be able to get a binary exact copy out again. Right? They should match exactly. But that's not really the case at the minute. If you use Docker files, you'll have a hard time doing that because of things like timestamps uh, and build IDs and, and other stuff. I think it is just about possible Docker files now, but it takes some work. Um, increase your salsa level. Uh, yeah, I don't have, this would be a whole another talk. Uh, but you can go and look at something called slsa.dev. It's pronounced salsa. Uh, it's supply chain levels for software artifacts. I'm impressed to remember that. Um, and basically, it's a set of, it's a framework, but it's really sort of multi-level checklist for ways to improve the security of your build servers and your build system. Um, so if you're interested, definitely go and take a look, but it does get quite in depth. Um, who here has heard about SBOMs? Oh, that's a lot. I guess I'm talking to the right conference. So software bill of materials. Um, in my experience, this is like something for the future. It's sort of coming through at the minute. It's kind of being forced by regulation, partly as a result of the solar wind stuff. Um, ideally, at some point in the future, we'd be in a situation where uh, you know, for your production server, you'd have a complete bill of materials for everything that's running in production. Uh, and you'd be able to say like which versions of which libraries you're currently using. Um, but really, nobody can do that at the minute, or uh, nobody, um, very few people at least. Um, verifying provenance. So these are Melton Mowbray port pies. Nope, I thought I had a slide now. Um, yeah, so verifying provenance. This is just about making sure you know what you're running, um, that you know like where your container images came from, that they came from who you think they came from, and that nobody could have tampered with them um, in the meantime. Uh, yeah, so the analogy here is Melton Mowbray pork pies. You want to be sure that your Melton Mowbray pork pie came from Melton Mowbray, and nobody's been able to tamper with it before you eat it. Uh, the way we do this with uh, container images is to sign them. Um, and the project that I'd recommend here is SIGStore. Uh, TrainGuard is quite heavily involved with, with SIGStore, so there is some bias there. Uh, but it is used in Kubernetes, so all the Kubernetes images are now signed with SIGStore. Um, helpfully, the signatures are now stored alongside images in the registry. So I don't know if you, some of you probably used Notary, like the old V1 version of Notary. And in that case, you had to like spin up a whole separate server which stored your signatures. Um, with SIGStore, it's stored in the registry right next to the images. Um, there's also something pretty cool called keyless signing. So there's a mode that you can set Cosign or SIGStore to use where you don't have to take care of a private key anymore, which is really cool and really helpful because I hate you know, if you have to create a private key and keep it safe and you worry about losing it or hackers getting access to it and bad things happen if that happens. So let's try and do a quick demo of SIGSTOR. Oh, that works. OK, so I'm going to build a Docker image here.
it doesn't really matter what's in it. It's quite uh, simple. So I've built um, this WTF SRE image. I'm going to push it to my own um, repository on the Docker Hub. So when we're signing stuff for cosign, we're always signing like something in the registry. I'm not really signing the, the local image. Well, not at all signing the local image. Um, now, when I've pushed it, it's given me back the digest, which is like a, a content-based hash. So I know it refers to exactly that image. And that's what I'm going to sign. I'm going to sign the hash. I'm not going to sign the tag, because the tag can change and point to something different. I want to be sure that I'm signing exactly this image. I'm going to set, I'm going to get, hang on, maybe I can keep this a bit higher, two, six. There we go. I see all my slack in the background, but anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're turning on Cosine Experimental. I, I think that's, they're trying to make it stable now. There's some reason that it's hard to get rid of the variable that I don't quite understand. But it is pretty stable. So I'm going to sign using this hash. At this point, you will have realized that I'm not typing this out by hand. I do have a script in the background. But this is a live demo. Uh, so I've done cosine sign here. Note that I haven't passed any keys. Normally at this point, and you can with cosine, you can say, hey, sign it with this key. But I've not done that. So because I've not done that, what it's done is it's generated ephemeral keys. So it's generated a temporary private public key pair in memory. Um, it's then gone to another service called Fulcio and asked it for a certificate. Now, to ask it for a certificate, it needs to give it an identity. So that's why I'm getting all this blurb. And it's saying, am I sure I want to continue? I'm going to hit yes. And what it's done in the background is it's opened this up. And it's asking me to log into an OICD provider. Uh, and this is going to be used to verify my identity with Falsio. So I'm going to say GitHub. And hope this works. That looks good. OK. And so it's gone to Falsio. It's used my OCID credentials to get a certificate. It's then um, associated that certificate, or bound that certificate to the public private key pair it created. It's then signed the container with the private key, created the signature, which is pushed to the Docker Hub registry, but it's also pushed it to a transparency log. Now, that transparency log um, is like a public service that anybody can go and look up, and that will verify that, that, was, that this image was signed at this particular point in time. So I, I guess what we're saying is this image was signed by somebody that had access to my OIDC credentials for GitHub at this specific point in time. Now, I'm not an expert in cosine, but that's basically what's going on. Um, so obviously, the important thing is, can we verify something that's been signed? Uh, so I'm running this verify command here. I do have to tell it who I expect it to be signed by. So if you use an old version, you didn't have to do that. But it does make sense to have to specify who you expect. You can use a regular expression and say star if you don't actually care. Um, yeah, so I'm saying I expect it to be signed by me. So this is the primary email address associated with a GitHub account. Uh, and the OIDC issuer was GitHub. Uh, and this is the image name. And hopefully that will work. Yay. So what's all in there? Oh, so I've obviously run this before, so there's actually two signatures. But this is the repository that we're looking at. This is a specific, man uh, specific digest of the image that we signed. Um, yeah, that's the issuer there. We've got a timestamp that seems to be in a base64 payload there which is the actual signature, uh, timestamp, issuer, and subject. So that's basically the, the signature. And we've verified that has been signed by me. OK, I think that was it for SigStore. Cool. 
Yeah, so with regards to signing, um, try to use images and software that's signed, whether it's with SIGStore or GPG or whatever. Um, yeah, please go and sign your own images. You can see it's not too hard nowadays. Um, if you're using GitHub Actions, there's a GitHub Action that can use Cosign and it can use the Keyless stuff. Um, and what it does is it uses the OIDC token already in the GitHub Action, so it just sort of works automatically. Uh, and that's really pretty cool as well. And that's how um, chain guide images that I'll show you in a minute are signed. Um, now, there's no point in signing stuff unless you verify signatures. Uh, one way to do that is to use um, an admission controller on your Kubernetes cluster or a policy management solution, um, things like OPA or Kyverno or Chain Guard Enforce, which is our own policy management. Um, and if you're using images from third parties and they're not signed, yeah, go and ask them if they can sign their images. Uh, and maybe we can get you know, the whole industry to start signing stuff. OK, the next thing, scan your images. So yeah, if you're not using one already, I do recommend trying out like an image scanner, something like Gripe, Trivi, Sneak. Um, Docker has their own one. They used to use Sneak, but now they have their own one, which is Docker Scout. Uh, basically, what all of these things do is they try and get a list of all the software in your container, normally just by asking the package manager, so like APK or Dev or whatever. Um, they get a list of all the software, and they compare the versions of that software to CVE databases. Um, the, the results can be kind of noisy. So I don't know if you've run, it's like the node image, for example. If you run like a scan on that, you'll get a lot of results, which is, yeah. <laughs> I managed to, like, you can see I just edited these slides. I've got a typo there. But um, yeah, the problem is you get so many results, um, you kind of end up thinking, well, it, it becomes almost not useless, but it becomes very difficult to deal with. Because if I get a report with like hundreds of vulnerabilities, what do I do with that? I don't have time to go through each one and check them. But that's ideally what you would do. Um, so yeah, things become a bit self-defeating. But you can reduce the number of vulnerabilities to zero or close to zero. And the way to do it is really to cut out as many of the dependencies as you possibly can. Because what you'll find is a lot of these vulnerabilities are coming from software that isn't even used in your image. Like, you know, there might be sed or something silly lying there. Your, your software doesn't call out to sed, but it's still there and it's still potentially, you know, getting hit as a vulnerability. Um, yeah, so cut the cut, um, dependencies down, also keep everything updated as much as possible. Uh, so using the latest versions, uh, and use images from other people that do this. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. There is something called VEX. Um, Andrew Marta mentioned it yesterday in passing. Uh, it's kind of for the future. We're still arguing over exactly what it means. But VEX basically gives us a way that, um, to say, OK, I'm aware that these vulnerabilities or scanners are reporting these vulnerabilities, but they're not an issue because of X, Y, or Z. So I guess the idea is we'll be able to take the results from a scan, pipe it through VEX, uh, and get like a, a true set of much smaller set of vulnerabilities out. OK, so how do you cut down the dependencies? The easiest one is just to use smaller base images. Uh, so this should be a really easy change. If you're using, um, I don't know, Redis or something, you can just change the tag to be slim or alpine, uh, and you'll get an image with much less in it. Um, uh, yeah, and this is a really simple change. You can go and do it today, and you'll probably find it won't affect you. Like, it'll just work the same, but you'll have less um, vulnerabilities. And this is good, but you can go a lot further. Like, you still, like with Debian Slim, there's still, like, I don't know, 40 megabytes of operating system code stuff that you probably don't need. Um, and the other thing is, if you're using Alpine, you're going to be linking against the Muzzle C library, not glibc, um, which can cause issues for some people. Um, why not Scratch? So you can take things really far. Say I've got a statically compiled binary. I can stick that in like a Scratch image and um, run a completely empty thing, just has a binary. But the problem you'll probably hit 
is that most applications actually expect some stuff. So CA certificates is a really common one, but also programs often like expect a directory layout, things like temp to exi exist, maybe slash home, things like that, and also users. So, so the, the main tool that's, or the most common tool at the minute that's sort of in between is this distrolist project from Google. They basically took the Debian distro and stripped it down so it just had those things in it. Um, it's much, much smaller, just a little bit bigger than Scratch, really. Um, there's no package manager or shell by default. Um, Distrolist is cool, but it is limited to like only a few images, so there's like a static image for putting in statically compiled binaries. There's also a Java image and a Python image, and there might be a couple of others, but that's about it. The really frustrating thing, though, is Distrolist is hard to extend. So if I want to put one more package in it, for like a library or something. You can do that, but you've got to go and pull apart their, their Basil build and their Basil, depending on where you are, side of the Atlantic. But um, you've got to pull apart that build, and it's not nice. And it's not easy. So um, that's why at ChainGuard, we created our own version of this for this effectively. Um, it's much easier to extend and customize. We have our own uh, build system called APKO. Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll give you a quick demo. Um, we have both base and application images. So we have the, you know, the, the static version where you can put in your statically compiled binary, but we also have application images for things like Nginx and Redis. Um, we generate SBOMs. Uh, we keep things continuously updated. Uh, we have, yeah, we, we compiled against GLBC. We actually use APK format, the, the Alpine package manager format, but everything's compiled against GLBC. Uh, and uh, our Linux distribution is called Wolfie. Uh, yeah, try and quickly do a demo. I'm slightly worried about time now. So this is the Nginx image from the Docker Hub. This is your default image. You just take the, the, the base one, and you'll see it's got a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. But also, it's got 143 packages in there. So there's a lot of software in that image. Alpine is a lot better, but I did scan it this morning. This is like the latest image. If you go and sc scan this today, you should get the same results. And Alpine's actually got a few more vulnerabilities than I expected. And some of them are kind of interesting, because this is saying, well, actually, you can get a newer version of this package from Alpine. But obviously, the Docker image, well, not obviously, but um, the Docker image hasn't been updated, so it hasn't picked up these new versions yet. You'll see, like, in a week, these will go away, because it'll be rebuilt with new versions. Um, then we can have a look at the ChainGuard version. Oh, you also see the 63 packages there. Um, there's still 28 packages, so even less in it. But most importantly, there's zero vulnerabilities. And yeah, that's just because our stuff's a little bit more up to date. And because we control things down to the um, Linux distribution level, we can like rebuild things and get the patches in and the image built on the same day or hour even. OK. Um, yeah, the way we do this is with Apco, which is our open source tool for building container images. It's reproducible, so if I run it twice, I should get exactly the same output. It's declarative. I don't have, we don't have like run statements like you do in Docker. Um, everything's installed via APK. You can't go and curl a random file. You have to put everything in an APK package. Um, yep. So let's see Apco. So this is what an Apco YAML looks like. Uh, we're saying we're using Wolfie, which is our Linux distribution. And this is everything that's in the Nginx image. So this is Nginx. Uh, so Nginx package, unsurprisingly, um, this is some extra config for it. You don't actually have to have that. Um, Wolfie base layout, that's just the directories and stuff, and CA certificates, unsurprisingly. Uh, also set up some users and some directories. Um, entry point, command, stop signal. So Nginx expects sig quit and not sig kill. And which arcs you want to build for. OK, so this is building on my local laptop. Mm. So that's my Apco build, um, and it's given me a file out.tar. With the out.tar, oh, it's also given me an SBOM. 
So S bombs like a, a bill of materials with all the software that's in that container. Um, to put it into Docker, I can just do Docker load, and this loads this image. Um, so that image is 6.3 megabytes, built at 1210. This is the SHA sum, so we can try and remember this 2C2 CE54. I run it again, and with any luck, because what could have changed, I guess, is those libraries, could, packages could have been updated. So it is possible. But this goes horribly wrong. Um, so we've got a new version built at 12.11, still 6.3 megabytes, and the share sums are, is identical. So if I run it twice, I get exactly the same results out. Uh, and one of, the ways, one of the things we had to do to get that to work is set all the timestamps to be, uh, I think, the Unix, the epoch, maybe. So if you, going, if you were to like, create an image with a shell, you'd see the date was set to like 1970. Okay. Okay, I think I've made it just about in good time. Um, yeah, so this is just the same slide as before. I just want to repeat that this is the kind of easy stuff you can go and try and do tomorrow. Um, yeah, signing, verify like the stuff that you're putting into your images, sign your own images, really cut down on your software dependencies if you can, that's the way to get to zero vulnerabilities. Um, and keep things up to date. Uh, yeah, and try a security scanner if you're not already. Okay, thank you very much.